Okay, so welcome everyone to the second part of uh, first day uh, of spaces of homomorphism and classifying spaces. So our speaker is mentor Staffa, and uh, he's going to tell us about stability properties of uh, spaces of committing elements. So the floor is yours, uh, mentor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for organizing this workshop. It's been a while and it's nice to see all of the people involved in some of the research I'll be talking about. Um, so I didn't know what the audience would be like, so I guess most people would be from the field that we you know will be talking about, but I'm going to give some more basic introduction for maybe people who are not very familiar with uh, the topics. Um, so this work that I'm going to talk about is joint work with Dan Ramras, who is also going to give a talk, but on a different topic. And um, if you have any questions uh, at any time, please let me know, stop me, okay? Um, so again, my talk will be on stability properties of spaces of commuting elements. Now, uh, in my talk, I'm going to talk ab about many different spaces, but I'll focus on uh, mainly one space, and then all the other results are going to come from that space. Okay. So let me see if this works. Okay, cool. Um, so as I said, this is joint with Dan. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm going to give an introduction first, a very basic introduction. Hopefully it's, going, it's not going to bore some of you who already know this. So I'm going to give some examples and results. And I'm going to talk about some results that uh, Dan and I have uh, proved. Uh, so basically the hilbert Poincaré series of um, these spaces, of spaces of pairwise commuting elements in Lie groups. And I'm going to talk about homological stability and representation stability. Um, I, I'll give you a very brief overview of uh, what the theory talks about and the tools that we need um, in our paper, um, in our work to prove the results. And then I'm going to talk about the main results. And at the very end of the talk, if I, if I have time, I'll talk about um, how the proofs go. Okay, I'll give you a very brief overview of the proofs. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, I think Daisuke is going to give a talk on uh, his work. and he has extended some of the results that we have proved here in this talk. Uh, so maybe when he gives his own talk, he'll talk about it. I'm not really sure. But I'll just uh, So when, when the time comes, I'm going to tell you exactly uh, what results they have extended and they have improved, okay? With another collaborator. All right. So it's my first time using my iPad when I give a talk. So. <laughs> All right, so here is the setup. So we have a, a compact Lie group that we call G, okay? And usually this will be uh, one of the groups in, in the classical list of groups, like SONs, uh, SUNs, and, and um, SPNs. And um, you, you can also consider, for example, the exceptional Lie groups like uh, G2, et cetera. And uh, so the same result would, would follow, okay, in any of those uh, groups. Well, it depends on the, on the, on the theorem, but um, many results will follow for all types of groups. And in this case, pi is a finite generated discrete group. Let's say that this has n generators, okay, n is a finite number and a finite integer. And um, we want to study the following spaces. So we want to study the spaces of group homomorphisms, okay, that we denote by this uh, notation. And this is basically, uh, if you have n generators, then you can identify this space with a subspace of g to the power of n, which consists of uh, n tuples, okay? Um, this can be also seen as a variety, for example, take g to be an algebraic group where the variety is carved out by the relations in the group. And, um, we also are going to talk about the representation space, uh, which means you take this uh, space of homomorphisms and mod out by the action of G on each coordinate, okay? And the action is by conjugation. And of course, so these are the main, uh, the, the two main uh, spaces, and we're going to talk about variations of these that have appeared in a work of many of you guys. Uh, so, when the time comes, I'm going to talk about those spaces as well. So these are these other variations that I have not listed here. Okay. And the main case in this talk is basically if you take this 
group pi to be the free abelian group of rank n, which means that uh, this space becomes uh, the space of n tuples in g to the power of n, and these uh, tuples are pairwise commuting tuples. Okay, and then you take you mod the space by g. And then you obtain this other space here. Now, of course, we're going to uh, do more restrictions here because these spaces are not always path connected. Uh, so we're going to usually work with the path uh, component of the trivial representation. Right. Some very basic examples. Um, so if you just take your pi to be z, then um, this space is just g. Okay. I'm giving you the easiest possible examples because, you know, in general, it's hard to describe the space in, you know, and, and tell you what it exactly is in terms of known spaces. Uh, so if you take a pi to be the free abelian group, so this is free. Sorry, not free abelian group, but just free group. Okay. In this case, just a free group. Then um, there is no restrictions on, there are no relations. So you get all of the G to the N. And if G is abelian, then the space of all commuting n tuples in an abelian group is obviously everything as well, right? Um, now, this is more general, but if you take the representation space um, of U R, so U is this is a unitary group, okay? And this is homeomorphic. This should be homeomorphic to uh, you. Just take the maximal torus to the power of n and then mod by sr, where sr acts diagonally, okay? So this acts diagonally. All right, this is actually more general. You can just take any uh, g here. Let's say g is uh, compact and connected. Then you'd have the maximal torus of g, okay? And then the same thing holds. Of course, here you should have the wild group. Sorry, let me... Let me silence my phone. All right. Um, and as I said, if you take uh, the space of, um, so if you take the homomorphisms from the free abelian group to G, then you can identify this with pairwise commuting n tuples. And this is an ordered tuple, okay, in G. All right. And uh, this is, again, one of the main spaces in this talk. Now I'm going to talk about some main results. These are the main results that uh, basically have led to uh, my work with Dan. And I'm sure there, there's much more uh, new work out there that is not directly related to our work. So I apologize if your name is not in this list. Uh, your work is equally or you know, more important for sure. So I just wanted to mention some results that actually have uh, you know, directed my work and this uh, work with, with Dan. So as I said before, you can think of uh, pi as a finite group of, uh, sorry, a finite generated group with some relations. And this is going to carve out some real algebraic variety. Okay, so you can think of that like that. So you can do algebraic geometry with these uh, spaces. And um, Adam and Cohen in 2006, they uh, sort of, were the, the catalyzers of my work um, in my PhD thesis and also the work leading to this uh, work uh, to this paper on stability. So they first proved that if G is a closed subgroup of G, L, and C, then there's a homotopy equivalence between these two suspensions. So if you suspend this, this space once, then this decomposes into the following subspaces. So you take um, let me let me say it like this. You take hom z k comma g, so this is the commuting k tuples, and then you mod out by the subspaces where uh, at least one at least one of the coordinates I think is the identity, and there are n choose k copies of this, and you do this for all integers from one to n. Okay, and is the um, is the rank of the free building group on the left. And I'm, uh, I've used this uh, theorem many times, and uh, I'm going to tell you again where I've used it uh, when I introduce the results. And one other very important uh, result is of Tom Baird in 2007, 
who says that it, it says more than this uh, statement here, but uh, one main result is that the rational homology of this space, this space here, uh, this subscript means the trivial, the component of the trivial representation. Okay, and we're going to use this all the time uh, because we want a connected space. So this is given by the following. You just take the homology of G mod T and the homology of the maximal torus to the power of N, and then you take the W coinvariant. And in this case, uh, torsion divides the order of the wild group. So this is, um, so basically you can take this equivalence to be with rational coefficients or with coefficients in a ring where uh, the order of the wild group has been inverted. Okay, so another uh, result is a result by uh, Gomez, Petet, and Soto. Uh, so they prove that the fundamental group of this space is the same as the fundamental group of G raised to the power of K. Now, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention here in the, after the second result. So there's a similar result. Um, if you just take the space, I think it was SU2. So if you take this to be SU2, uh, there is, um, yeah, it should be as you do. So there is a result by Lisa Jeffrey and Paul Silic, who are in the audience. I also want to mention the result that they split this space in terms of thumb spaces. Okay, and that's a very nice result. Uh, and nobody has been able to extend it yet. Uh, if it can be done, for um, example, for other Lie groups, and that's also I think only for um, for SU two. That's what I remember. All right, um, so another result is by Petit and Soto, which basically tells us that you can work more than with just, with just compact groups. So they say that if you have a reductive algebraic group, K, inside G, and if this is a maximal compact subgroup, sorry, if K is a maximal compact subgroup of a reductive algebra, algebraic group G, then there is a strong deformation retraction um, of this space onto this space. Uh, in particular, this shows that uh, the homology groups of both spaces are the same. Okay. So for example, instead of working with uh, uh, you know, GL and C, you could work with, uh, for example, with other, you can work with UN, right? If you want to do cohomology. Uh, co Some more results. Uh, so in uh, in a similar uh, context, you can just work with the representation spaces, right? And work with a maximal subgroup of a reductive algebra group G. Then the same uh, result holds, which means that this representation space is a strong deformation retraction of this other representation space. Okay, um, so in, in other words, for example, the homology groups to be the same, right? The rational ones, because um, that's what, what we're interested in. That's what we are interested in. Uh, so in, in, another thing I wanted to mention here is that, so these both results are uh, stated for the free abelian group. And uh, Maxim Bergeron, he was able to extend this uh, from a free abelian group to another group, gamma, which is a finely generated nilpotent group, and the same result holds. Okay, so basically, the space of homomorphisms from gamma to G uh, deformation retracts onto the subspace, where again, uh, K is a maximal subgroup of G. Um, so there are many other results after this, uh, which go in different directions. So one example I wanted to mention here is uh, this result of Adem Gomez, uh, Lind, and Tillman, which basically uh, says the following. If you take the, um, if you take the geometric realization 
So I have to be careful here. So this G here is going to be not the, the Lie group, but it's going to be uh, a limit of Lie groups, okay? So SU, think of SU as the limit of all the SUNs with in, where the maps are just inclusions, but think of black, block inclusions. And if you take the geometric realization of these spaces, so this is basically take uh, the free group and mod by the Q stage in the um, descending central series, then this space is an infinite loop space for all Q greater than or equal to two. So basically they are able to define a sort of new cohomology theories using these spaces. And as I said, there are many other results that I'm not including here. Uh, newer results, like for example, the results of uh, Desu Kishimoto and, and, and his collaborator, uh, not only on stability, but also on, uh, for example, on torsion in these spaces. All right. Again, uh, if you want me to talk about your result or if you want to mention something which is important, please let me know and we can discuss it. Uh, now, two results that I wanted to mention that we worked with uh, then uh, are the following. So we wanted to understand the homology of these spaces. Uh, and of course, we know from uh, Baird's result that the homology of these spaces can be given in a certain way. Uh, but we also wanted to compute um, the Poincare series of these um, spaces. So in this case, with Dan, we're able to show that the Poincare series of the space of homomorphisms uh, from Zn into G. G in this case is a compact connected Lie group. And we just take the component of the trivial representation. We don't talk about the other components. Uh, so this Poincare series is given by the following. Uh, so you take this product here where uh, these Di's and the exponent of Q are the characteristic degrees of W. So all wild groups have certain characteristic degrees uh, that I can give you more information for. For example, uh, if you take, um, I think it's UN, if you take UN with a wild group, the symmetric group SN, these degrees DI are just one, two, three, up to N. Okay, so these are basically some uh, degrees of some um, invariant polynomials that are going to generate uh, a certain polynomial ring. And then we have this summation here over all elements of the wild group. Now, the way we prove this is we uh, take a more, uh, a better refinement of this um, Poincare series. So we take uh, basically degrees of certain components in our formula, but this is one way that you can write it. Um, now we're also able to uh, compute, I was also able to compute the uh, Poincare series of the representation space or the corresponding representation space. And this Poincare series doesn't really depend on the characteristic degrees of W at all. So this is just given by this formula here. Uh, now, of course, the, the proofs that we gave were more topological. So this is where we used uh, the de decomposition of um, uh, Adam and Cohen, and also some work that we've done before uh, in order to arrive to these formulas. But of course, the, you could also prove these formulas using just algebra, as Daisuke has done in his paper. And you can do this by using Baird's result, that the homology of this space is given by the homology of G mod T, tensored with the homology of uh, T to the N. Right, so this is not the only proof. And actually, I think they, Suka, they give an even better um, refinement of this formula because they were able to, for example, describe what these look like, okay? Because these are, I mean, these look nice. Maybe they're not very complicated to, to look at, but these are not very easy to compute. And Desuke in his paper, I think, gives some um, better formulas for these. Or I should say more computable formulas. All right. So two examples that you can compute. For, so you can take this to be any Lie group, uh, which is compact and connected. For example, if you take the exceptional Lie group G2, then this would be the Poincare series for a Hom Z2 from a G2. Uh, 
I think this would be Z2 here. Let me just change that. Oh wait, no, no, that's end. That's fine. Sorry, that is okay. Yeah. So the second formula is for commuting n tuples in U three. So this is a Poincaré series for that. And of course, uh, we computed this using computers. Okay. It's usually harder to do it by hand. You can do it for the low dimensional Lie groups, but for, for the higher ones, you need some help, I guess. All right. Um, so let me talk about this classical way of studying uh, these spaces. And uh, this is basically motivation from uh, Beard's work, Tom Beard's work. So what you can do is you can uh, take the following. So if you want to, uh, if you want to study these spaces, so basically you want to study commuting n tuples, right, in G. So one way you can do this is the following: you can take the maximal torus T of the Lie group G, okay, and then take this map. So this map is basically the following: if you have an m plus one tuple here, G comma T one up to Tn, then this G is going to conjugate each uh, element from the, from the maximal torus. And then uh, you have the following. And of course, these are going to commute again because of the conjugation, right? So these land into this space. All right, so and the, uh, the normalizer of the maximal torus x diagonally by conjugation on here. So basically you can uh, take the quotient by NT here and you have a similar map that lands on the right-hand side. And then you can reinterpret that map as follows, okay? You just take G mod T, the flag variety, uh, cross T to the N mod W. Now I should also say here that this actually lands in the component of the trivial representation, okay? It's not necessarily all of uh, the space. Of course, sometimes this is exactly the same as the space here, but in general, it's not. All right. Uh, so again, this map was cited by Beard in his paper. And also I use this in my work with uh, Professor Cohen and Dan Ramres to study the rational cohomology of these spaces. And, uh, this was one of the ways that we also studied, uh, you know, these spaces to understand the Poincaré series that I showed in the previous slide. How much time do I have? I have 25 minutes, right? More or less? Okay. All right, so um, let me talk about, so this is basically, uh, I just wanted to talk about this. Maybe this is known to most of you, but I want to talk about this because this is actually one of the main ingredients in our proofs for stability, okay? So to study the stability of these spaces, we actually use uh, this side, the left-hand side, okay? In this case, this side here to study a representation and then homological stability. Okay. And uh, to study the stability, we basically consider the four uh, classical uh, types. So we, we consider type A, but instead of uh, doing SUs, we're going to do U1, U2, et cetera. Um, and type B, we're going to do, uh, so these are the, the odd SONs. And then type C is SP1, SP2, and so on. So these are the symplectic ones. And then type D are the even SONs. All right, and then these have uh, wild groups as follows. So type A wild group is basically a symmetric group, okay? And type B is, we call this a sign symmetric group, uh, which is basically a root product of the cyclic group of two elements and the symmetric group. So think of this as permutations with signs, okay? And type D, and by the way, type B and type C have the same types of wild groups. And type D uh, is the even sign symmetric group. So this is basically the um, 
the sign symmetric groups that have only an even number of sign changes. You can think of it that way. So this is type D. Now, um, if you just take these types, type A, B, C, and D, just as spaces, I can think of them as spaces, then these four types actually satisfy homological stability, okay? In the following sense. So I'm going to define what homological stability means in this context. Um, so if you have a sequence of spaces or groups, for example, xn minus one, xn, xn plus one. So this, think of this as an infinite sequence, it could be finite. Uh, we say that this is homologically stable if the sequence of k homo homology groups uh, basically take the k homology of each space in the sequence or each group in the sequence, let's say with rational coefficients, stabilizes for sufficiently large n, which means uh, after a certain value of n, then these homology groups become the same. They're isomorphic. Okay, that's the idea here. So for example, maybe this n here depends on, uh, I mean, this n here that we say is sufficiently large n maybe depends on the on k or on something else, but this, is, this has to stabilize after a certain point, okay? All right. Now, of course, uh, you, you may ask, you already know the Poincaré series, so why do you even bother about these homological stability properties, right? And as I said before, even though we had these Poincaré series for the space of homomorphisms or the space of representations, it's not usually easy to compute that formula explicitly for all um, for all these Lie groups. Okay, so the these methods of homological and representation stability basically give you an idea of what the homology looks in the long term. If, for example, increase one of the parameters, maybe. Uh, uh, maybe the rank of the free abelian group or maybe the rank of the Lie group, okay? So we're going to look at all of those cases individually. All right. So we can compute basically only a few examples using computers, but if you want to do more, then it gets harder and harder. Okay, so again, uh, let this be a sequence of Lie groups of type A b c or d from the previous slide okay now we'll consider any of the vertical or horizontal sequences of spaces okay now if you look at the vertical sequences so the vertical sequences of uh, spaces basically increase the rank of the free abelian group okay and the horizontal ones increase the rank of the Lie group. Okay, so the subscript for G here stands for the rank of the Lie group. Think of it that way. Now, of course, when I was, when I was preparing these slides, I was thinking, okay, what happens if I go this way, right? Now, of course, maybe there is stability if you go that way too. I haven't really thought about that. But maybe so, if yeah. you... So I meant to go ahead. the vert vertical ones again. What are the... Oh, so the vertical ones, think of them as, uh, so this is commuting one tuple, commuting two tuples, commuting three tuples, but in the same Lie group, right? So you just include them. So these are just inclusions. In one of the factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can put ones, for example, right? At the end. Okay. Yeah, so this is for all the vertical ones, right? So and G2, I mean, this G2 is not like the exceptional one. G2, this is just one of the Lie groups in the sequence, then G3. So basically you can either fix the Lie group or you can fix the rank of the three abelian group, right? And then you can look at the spaces individually. All right, so uh, to study homological stability for each of these sequences, we're going to use a theory of representation stability. Okay, so if we can, for example, show that the homology uh, in each column or in each row is going to be representation stable with respect to some action, then we can show that this is going to give us a homologically stable uh, sequence. 
Okay, so let me talk now about representation stability. Um, so representation stability, uh, of course, has been used has been used for uh, you know for ma many years, uh, but one of the more recent uh, definitions or uses, which was basically brought to more prominence, I'd say, is uh, the work of Church, Tom Church, and Denson Farr. Okay. So they, they uh, you define and use representation stability to understand sequences of representations of the symmetric groups. Okay. Now in our case, we're going to let uh, WN, which is the, the, the wild group, the N of the infinite families of wild groups of type A, B, C, or D. Now remember that B and C are the same type. Okay, even though they come from different league groups, they're the same, and maybe they have different actions, but it's the same type. Okay, uh, so the definition is uh, uh, very easy, but of course the algebra behind this to prove something is a little more complicated. Um, so the definition is the following. So a consistent sequence of finite dimensional WN spaces. So remember WN is one of these wild groups. If you want, you can just think of SN, the symmetric group, okay? So basically you have a sequence of representations of these wild groups. So think of these, for example, uh, representations of the symmetric group. So this is a representation of SN minus one. This is a representation of SN, representation of SN plus one and so on. Okay, it keeps going like that. Um, so we say that this is a representation stable uh, if this sequence satisfies the following properties, okay? So the maps phi n, so phi n are basically the maps here. So this is phi n minus one. This is phi n, phi n plus one, and so on, okay? So if these maps phi n are injective for all n sufficiently large, okay? So for n large enough, these inclusions are not inclusions, I shouldn't say inclusions, these are maps, okay, not necessarily inclusions. These are going to be injective, okay? They're not uh, injective all the time. And then the image, so the second property is that the image uh, of phi n generates vn plus one as a qwn module for all n sufficiently large. So again, this means that after a certain point, the image of one of these maps and all the other maps after that are going to generate that module, the next module. Okay, I'm going to show you an example. Um, so basically, if you add, if you act by uh, WN, then it should generate all of the other elements or all of the other generators uh, in the module. Can and I then, just ask so Go ahead. These, these maps phi n are, are they're simply linear maps or are they uh, morphisms of representations in some sense or are they are they? Oh, these these are just uh, some think of them as linear maps with you know that, that respect this action of S n, right? So basically, you want uh, you know if you have a v here and you want to send this here with uh, uh, you know. Then if you add by SN here, okay, then of course you want to know where this map goes. For example, if you have sigma times V, there should be some compatibility under this map phi N here, okay? So there, there is some more involved definition here, but these are linear maps that should respect the action of SN. Does oh, it make okay. sense? Yeah, so phi N from VN to VN plus one, is yes. a morphism of WN representations. Yes. Because mm -hmm. where you think of WN as sitting inside of WN plus one? Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay. So then maybe is two, um, so the, the image would then be a WN module. So maybe you need WN plus one module or condition uh, two? Oh, this one here. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, let me think. Yes, because, okay, you're right. So if I look at the image of this in here, 
then of course it cannot necessarily generate all of Vm plus one, but if I act by Wm plus one, it's going to generate Vm plus one. So you're right. So let right. me fix this. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So this is M plus one. Okay, thanks. And these are complex representations, I guess, right? Here. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you can think of complex representations. Okay. Uh, yes. And if you, could, if you decompose uh, Vn into reducible Wn representations, then let's say you have some reducible representations, uh, and then they have some, you know, they have some uh, multiplicities, okay, for these irreducible representations. Then for each uh, lambda, so lambda is basically a partition of n, then you have the multiplicity is independent of n. For n larger than some big n, it depends on lambda, okay? Um, so this is a, the, the basic definition of a representation stable sequence of Wn modules. But again, you can think of uh, the symmetric group if you want. OK. All right, can so. I, can I ask a question? I didn't quite understand the previous sentence, because you said that, that lambda is a partition of n, but n keeps changing. Or am I, am I wrong here that n does not keep changing? You, you but got, for a fixed n, uh, well, for, for a fixed n, this lambda will depend on this little n here, right? Yes, but now, now you're going to change n. You say it's independent of n. So you've got this coefficient, and the coefficient has a lambda and an n. Uh, so how do I go from one end to another and ask that it doesn't change? Like lambda is a partition of n. So now I go to n plus 1. So mm -hmm. I, I can't talk about the old lambda anymore because it isn't a partition of n plus one. Oh, you mean this one here? But there are yeah. ways to go from partitions of, uh, you know, n to partitions of n plus one, right? You mean inducing you can, or something from- like, Yeah, inducing, yes. Okay. You have to induce, uh, um, I don't remember exactly what- uh, Yeah. The usual ways to add a box in the Young diagram. Yeah, you add a box, right? You add a box at the very end if you want. For example, you add the. Yeah. That's one way to do it. Yeah. That, that's or people will take lambda to mean the diagram without the first row, and then that does remain constant. Yeah. Okay. Is it is it clear? Uh, okay. Yeah, if adding box at the end makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, it fits with the example I know. Let's put it that way. Okay. All right. Uh, now, uh, Church, Elman, and Farb, uh, and Wilson uh, study some categories called FIW uh, uh, categories, or you can say um, so using those categories, they also study FW spaces or sequences. So this FIW category, this is the category of finite sets and bijections. So you can say, if you think of the symmetric group SN, this is basically, uh, you know, sets one through N. Okay. And then with extra properties on these, uh, uh, you know, morphisms based on whether you, you are working with type A, type B, type C, or type D. Okay. Now, I'm not giving you all the information here. Uh, basically, the morphisms in general would be just set inclusions. Okay. Um, now, a consistent sequence of WN representations is called an FIW module. Uh, and this is basically a functor from this category FIW to the category of Q modules. In this case, we're using just Q as the coefficients. Okay. And the definition for representation stability is the following. So a representation stable FIW, FIW module is uniformly representation stable if this n lambda here can be chosen independently of lambda. 
So basically, Paul, what this is saying is that we're, we're going to forget about lambda eventually if you're working with these stable sequences. Sorry, did we say the VNs were complex representations at some point? Or I mean, you can think of them as, as uh, but in this in this case, the homology will be over over Q, or you can think of uh, homology over you know any field of characteristic zero. So it could be, you can think of C if you want, complex representations, yeah. But you can think also of representations over Q. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But uh, in this case, we're using Q because, you know, the, the homology groups uh, are with Q coefficients. Or the cohomology groups. Now, we're going, sometimes in our proofs, we go back and forth between homology and cohomology. But if we, we can talk about homological stability, but also do work with cohomological stability, but then the maps have to be reversed and all of those things. All right, so an FIW module, so basically uh, a consistent uh, sequence of WN module representations is finally generated if there is a finite set of elements in the union of all of these uh, modules that are not contained in any proper sub FIW module of V. So this, basically this means that the images of these elements under FIW morphisms span each module VN. Okay. All right, so you want each, uh, each module to be generated by a finite uh, number of elements. So here's an example. Um, so you can take, for example, the polynomial ring with n generators, okay? Then this is an SN module for each n, right? Uh, where SN permutes the generators. And you can take the following uh, sequence. For example, you can take uh, this module here. This is an S1 module, and this is an S2 module, and this is an S3 module, and so on, okay? And now what you can do is you can consider the degree two submodules for example, the module generated by x1 squared, and then you have x1 squared, x2 squared, x1, x2, and the next one, and so on. Right? Uh, so basically, each of these, so each of these collection is going to be, uh, is going to generate the degree two submodules. Okay. Now we say that this is finally generated, since if you just pick this element and this element in each module in this sequence, then it's going to basically generate the entire module if you act on it by Sn, right? For example, there's a permutation that takes this index one to two and to three and to four, et cetera. And then you can take all the other combinations of Xi times Xj by a permutation of one and two. So this is, uh, the final, so this is basically a finite generated FIW module, just because this set generates each module. All right. I don't know if this was uh, one of the examples you had in mind, Paul, but this is one of the basic examples to describe what finite generation means in this case. All right, so uh, the results we're going to use are the following. So if you have an FIW module V over a field of characteristic zero, then this Vn is new form of representation stable if and only if V is finally generated. So basically, uh, if you just show finite generation, then this is equivalent to saying uh, that this sequence of, uh, in this case, Sn modules in the previous example, but in general, Wn modules are going to be, uh, so that sequence is going to be representation stable. Okay. And if, uh, as a corollary, if V is a uniform representation stable FIW module, then the multiplicity of the trivial representation is eventually, eventually constant, which means that if you take, uh, for example, the SN invariants, co-invariants in each case, then uh, you can talk about homological stability after that. All right. Now, yeah, do you have any questions before I talk about this table here? Okay. Um, so 
my am I out of time, Jihan, or how much time do I have? Because I want to plan. We uh, said that. Yeah, I mean, technically you are out of time, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so okay. I talked about all yeah. these things and didn't talk about the result. Okay, so let me say something very quickly here. Uh, uh, maybe three, four minutes. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds good. It, yeah. Okay, thank you. So you can take the symmetric. Uh, powers of x. So for example, in this case, this is equal to just x to the power of r mod sr. Okay, this is symmetric power. And this is basically the key to many of our results in this paper. Okay, uh, so we showed that if you take uh, this sequence of, uh, of spaces, let's say x, z, uh, x and then x, one, sorry, x2, x3, and so on. So basically there is a, a S1 action here, there's an S2 action here, S3 action here, and so on, right? And this is going to induce basically, um, you know, an action on the homology of each product. Then the sequence of homologies or the sequence of spaces is going to be homologically stable and the stable range is going to be R greater than or equal to K, which means that as soon as in the sequence, uh, as soon as R is greater than or equal to K, K is a homological degree, then the sequence becomes stable. So basically all the groups are isomorphic to each other up to that point. And the reason why this is important is that remember, the representation space uh, is homeomorphic to, I should say, homeomorphic to Tn uh, modulo Sn, right? If Sn, for example, is the, the wild group of G here, in general, you just say mod W, okay? And this is sort of a symmetric product if you do the uh, if you do some adjustments to this homeomorphism okay this is our main result and using this result here uh, you can show the following you can show that as i said you can show the results of the representation space because of this isom uh, isomorphism here in homology and you can also show uh, these last three results. But before I talk about these last three results, let me say the following. Uh, working with the space of homomorphisms itself requires us to use a different uh, set of tools, okay? We don't necessarily use this tool alone, okay? The homology of the symmetric uh, products, but we also use um, uh, G-equivalent cohomology and the eilenberg moore spectral sequence. Uh, and the reason is that the properties of the homomorphism spaces are not as simple as the properties of, in this case, uh, representation spaces, because representation spaces up to homeomorphism are just some sort of asymmetric product. Okay. So before I run, really run out of time, let me just say that on this table here, for each space on the left, we show that there is homological stability with this table range on the right hand side. And for the main result here that I didn't really have too much time to talk about, um, we show that this is the stable range and we get this weird bound here because of the spectral sequence. But uh, the good news is that Daisuke in his paper has showed that they have a much better result and they actually have a sharp bound for the homological stability, uh, which means that uh, there's no better bound than that, okay? And maybe he is going to say something about that in his talk, maybe not, but there is a better bound for this space at least, okay? And of course, we're not claiming that any of these spaces here, uh, any of these ranges is sharp, but, um, at least we got some of the uh, result using, again, symmetric products. And for this space here, using the Allenberg-Moore Allenberg spectral sequence 
didn't have talked, uh, much time to talk about. All right, so I just basically told you about this theorem on the table, and I think my time is up. Sorry for being over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mentor. Uh, so any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, there were a couple of questions uh, during the talk, but yes. uh, there's something I wonder, but I'm not sure how interesting that, that this question is. So instead of looking at these hop spaces from uh, z, z to power n, what happens if you replace it with uh, the detorsion version, like z mod d, for example? Is, uh, is it what? still... Uh, oh, I mean... Uh... Like what, just what do you, replace, what do you want to replace them for? Like uh, the, yeah, the modern ones? No, uh, D torsion ones. So instead of Z, I would like to take Z mod D, for example. Oh, I see. Uh, like adding in this extra D torsion condition on the tables. Yeah. Okay, so there, there, there is some more, um, if you just consider the representation space. And, the represent, uh, and so the represent, for the representation space, I think you can, you can count the elements. Yeah, so the and, representation space is trivial. I mean, it's yeah. just points, but the... Right. Yeah, but you can count the is, points. I mean, there is some work, there is some work in counting the points. Um, I don't remember the names of the authors because they're not really doing this sort of stuff, but there is some work in that direction for, uh, for the presentation spaces, which as you see, they're just points. But we haven't really considered uh, that question for the hump spaces. Uh, now, of course, I don't know. Um, I, mean, you, I think for finite groups, you'd get, um, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I think you'd get manifolds. Uh, I think there's a, there's a statement like that in, Adams and Cohen's paper. Maybe uh, if you if you select the correct representation, then I think you get manifolds out of that, you know, space. But I don't know how helpful that is. I mean, that's the only thing I know. But we haven't really considered the because we don't really know what to identify it with, right? In this case, for example, we identify this space, this space with this space, right? Because we know this from Beard's work, but if you have like Z mod N here or something, I don't really know how to work with that. Uh, but but in, in general, isn't, let's say, I mean, just take G to be something uh, ordinary, like uh, like a unitary groups, for example, then, mm. uh, so you, you yes. have a map from the home spaces, right? You can just take things to the D to power and you have, you, you have like uh, uh, the home Z mod Ds appear as a, uh, as a subspace, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. ones that, that just go to the point, like one, 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 one. And yeah. is, it, is it possible to deduce something uh, about the detorsion ones by just looking at this map in general? Um, I mean, not that I know of, but I mean, I'd have to think about that because I never thought about that question, but yeah, maybe. I say maybe. Yeah, I, I think in general there there are maps like you can just take the deep power and yeah. then these torsion ones somehow appear as a subspace. So they... yeah. So you want to send something about those spaces or something about their stability? Yeah, I mean in or general anything. In, in general, I was curious about this map, but the, in in this context for the stability, yeah, stability. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, mean, in general, I don't really know. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, can I just I can I just ask? Isn't isn't in the case when you look at um, just uh, elements of uh, finite order? Um, isn't then the the hum space just some disjoint union of uh, homogeneous spaces or something like this? Yeah, um, probably yeah, because the because the quotient space is just a discrete set of points. Set. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe the hum spaces are still too easy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, I guess for stability, you also have to count the, even for stability of the representation spaces, you'd have to count the number of path components yeah. um, and see if those stabilize. But 
um, just a quick question. Can you go back to your table, the last one that you had? This, uh, this one? Right. So in, in all of these examples, the lead group um, that you have here in the target, well, is, is a topological group. I see you have, for instance, some results about the space become. What if you, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have thought about a, this, replace the lead group by a finite group, let's say the symmetric group. Any? Oh, oh I see. Uh, like B come here with this, like with a symmetric group, you're saying like, like right. sigma R or yeah. something. Uh, no, I haven't really looked into that, but I think this, this is in your work, right? With uh, this other guys. Um, well, I know Omar is going right. to be talking about yeah. these spaces, so that's why I was asking mm -hmm. if you have. Yeah, in that no, case, right. you definitely no, don't want to take the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't thought of those either. No, no. But those are great questions. Maybe. Uh... I I have a question. Um, yes. In 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 the formula of the Poincaré series that you guys give, which is pretty nice. Uh, do you do can you find some uh, some uh, so, some of the coefficients explicitly, like like the formula general? looks really nice. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. for, like for example, the for the unitary groups or something like that. I mean, like the formula is really nice, but but then my question is, can you, if you have like like say the unitary groups, yeah, at a, and maybe a certain degrees, can you give a closed formula or is it too complicated? Yeah. I think if you use the Sukas work, I think he has a much better version of this formula, which means basically they have a better version of this side here. Uh, and they actually give an explicit way of computing it, but you still have to do some work. Uh, I mean, there is, there is a way. So in theory, there is a way. Basically, there is a better formula than this one that the Suka gave with his co-author. Co uh, but I haven't tried like using it to, to find a specific uh, you know, coefficient, but according to what they say, it should be much more computable than this. So I'm guessing that they can find using their, their version of the formula, they can find the specific coefficient for a specific you know, term, like T15 or something, I don't know, or Q15. So in theory, yes, okay. they have a better version, yeah. Okay. But with this Thank one, you. it's hard. Like with this version of the formula, it, it's harder. It's harder to point out. Can I quickly ask a, a question? Um, have you thought about uh, homology stability for other coefficients than, than Q? Uh, like what, for example? Like I mean, like the we, integers, for, for instance. Uh, not really, because I mean in. So in the context of this work, um, we, we need Q or at least um, basically a, a field with characteristic that doesn't divide the, or it's a, it's a primary order of the wild group, right? I mean, that's something that we need. Uh, so to work with uh, the integer coefficients, you need some other tools, right? Because we don't really know much about integer coefficients in general. Like even like a, like another model for hum would be really nice, uh, but in this case we I don't know any better model than just hum itself. So if you just want to work for, for SU two, where I happen to know all the groups, it does work yeah. for Z mod two. If you look at the two torsion, um, yeah, exactly. They do stabilize mostly to zero, <laughs> except except for H two. Their higher ones just stabilize to zero, but they do stabilize. So Paul, oh, does this follow? They don't stabilize. Your... To, sorry, but they do stabilize. They don't stabilize to zero. Sorry. Okay. But they do. So does this follow from your from your decomposition or something related? Well, we, to your... we get an exact formula for for okay for the for the groups. So okay, that's yeah. only for so. Us. so uh, I've, been, I've been sorry. Um, I, I've been thinking about the the unitary groups um, quite a bit, and I think they're. Uh, uh, one, one does actually have homology stability also with integer coefficients, um, but I, I, I don't know how, how that would, um, I, I might be saying something about this when I give a talk on Thursday, 
but uh, I have no clue uh, if that would hold for other groups like orthogonal groups or something. So I was just wondering if you have like have a thought about so, that. So you know what happens to the torsion basically? Or, I mean, well, you, you know that idea. they stabilize. Um, you still yeah. have to, yeah, it doesn't tell you what the groups directly are. It just tells you what, I guess you could compute the stable groups because you do understand, at least for the unitary groups, you do understand the the the, the direct limit when the rank goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, but it's very specific to the unitary groups. And yeah, um, I, I don't know uh, what methods one could use to say anything about orthogonal groups. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to hear about that in your, in your talk. Yeah, yeah, so, sounds interesting. Maybe, maybe I'll just comment that you know one of your examples was the symmetric product or symmetric power of a space X, and homological yeah. stability there is a is a classical result. I think it's going to dold, and uh, there it does work over over the energies as well. So yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Oh, shall we move uh, to the next talk? I think it's time. Okay, thank so you, Mentor. I have, I have some more thank questions. You. Thank you, everyone. Yes.